Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Bulletproof Hygiene Podcast. Thanks again for joining us. Today, Sharisa and I are kicking it off talking about hygiene socials and team morale, team culture, everything in between. And Sharisa and I were just chatting about how, you know, team morale is a highly underrated, undervalued thing in organizations today and how the culture and the morale really set the tone for strategizing and goal setting and the things that are built on top of those things. Uh, we think it's kind of a topic that's often skipped because it is, it is underrated, you know, unfortunately. Um, so we want to dive deep and kind of talk about what does morale mean? What is team culture? How do we shape morale and team culture? Why do these things matter? What's detrimental, you know, to our team culture? What can, what can really bring it down? And then some things that have worked for us to uh, really start to cultivate the culture that we want and the morale that we want within our practices. Um, and I, and I also do want to preface, um, I'm, I'm a little under the weather today, so I apologize if I sound a little nasally, I'm doing my best. Um, uh, I'm taking some day quill and believe it or not in a pandemic, we have found that the common cold does still in fact exist. So yes. I apologize. I'm, I'm doing my best here. Try not to sniffle too much into the microphone, but please bear with me. I am uh, functioning. I'm highly functioning on, on day quill here. I'm, I'm doing my best today. So thanks for bearing with me. And on that shall we jump right into morale? Yeah, let's. I mean, I know you and I have big backgrounds. We both played, you know, we're both athletes growing up. We played on a lot of sports teams. And I think that we see the value of that because that's, that's our background. We understand how important it is that everybody understands their roles and everybody's functioning together and everybody's connected and everybody's understands, you know, what the goal and, and what the mission are. And so I think, not everybody always understands that. And I think coming from our backgrounds, like we have, we, we really get this and, and see how important it is. Yeah. It's, it's unreal. It's, I know this is going to be mind boggling, but we're not robots. We actually do have emotions and, you know, thoughts and we have uh, uh, mental parts and spiritual parts and relational parts, and they all kind of need to be um, developed. And this is, this is the more like emotional relational part that is, you know, high on uh Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And it's, but it's, but it's a pretty, it's a pretty basic need, you know, it's, it's a, it's just above it's in the esteem needs section. So it's just above kind of some of our very, very basic survival needs. Well, and we think about like, how many hours do we spend at our practices? How many hours are we there together all day? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times it's a lot more hours than we're spending at home with our families and our loved ones. So developing that team culture that is, that is fun and exciting and efficient and supportive is super, super important to our long-term happiness and, and fulfillment in our profession. So uh -huh. yeah, it's something yeah. we've got to talk about. Totally, totally. I agree with you completely. Um, totally worth talking about. So let's jump, let's jump into it by talking about the definition of morale. So the definition, actually, I'm not sure which dictionary this is from, just the dictionary, um, is the confidence, enthusiasm, and discipline of a person or group at a particular time. Sounds pretty important to me. Um, as we mentioned, you know, culture comes before strategy because it's all of it's all the, the, the things that strategies are going to be able to build upon. If everyone's not um, on the same page in regards to our attitudes, our agreements, our come from, our uh, transparency, our, you know, some basic relational and communicative things, if we're, if we're not coming from the same place, it's, it's going to cause a, a scramble. It's going to make a lot of the strategizing and the goal reaching and the goal setting a lot more difficult than it has to be because we don't even know, you know, it goes back to like the core values that we talk about all the time and, and the vision and like, are we all on the same page here? Like it's worth talking about having an open dialogue and even setting aside intentional time to kind of review these things, because this is what, what everything else is going to develop out of. Well, absolutely. So I think a lot of practices you know, they might find themselves kind of stuck or stale or trying to, you know, incorporate something new and different. And they, they kind of start to create, try to create those strategies of like, how are we going to do this? And what systems are we going to use? But if you don't have that cohesiveness of the team mm -hmm. ahead of time, those strategies are going to fall flat really quickly. Yep. Um, I know you and I both have been part of practices who developed our mission statement together as a team, mm -hmm. which is really, really important because, you know, who likes to be told to do something? Not really anybody, but who likes to be asked to do something? 
most of us. So I think it's really important as you're thinking about your team culture is, does everybody have a voice? Does everybody have a say? Does everybody feel like they're a part of it? And when, especially when you're kind of starting things off, if, you, if you're looking, you're like, hmm, I'm not sure we're really cohesive right now. Let's get back to that, to the basics of what is our mission here? and What is our goal? Mm-hmm. You know, in most practices, I would say it's the basic goal is to bring that patient through the front door, give them the best experience, the best level of care, the best treatment, and, and, you know, escort them back out the door. And so you think about how many people touch that patient as they're walking through the practice, you know, from, from your business team that's welcoming them to the assistant that might be seating them to the doctor that's treating them or the hygienist that's treating them to maybe the treatment coordinator that's meeting them. Like there's a lot of people that are involved. Maybe they have a question for the insurance coordinator, but there's so many people that have the opportunity to kind of have an impact on that patient as they move through. If we're not all focused on the exact same goal, and sometimes we get kind of tunnel vision, right? And we understand this as hygienists because we literally have a thousand things to do in every appointment. So sometimes we kind of forget like the big picture, that 30,000 foot view of what that patient is going to go through and that experience. And we kind of get like, you know, tunnel vision of like, oh, this is my patient and this is my schedule and this is what I got to do today. And we kind of forget about, you know, the hygienist next door or the doctor down the hall or, you know, what something else that's going on that they might need us for as well. And when we kind of forget and lose sight of that main goal, I think that's when people start getting frustrated and they feel like they're not part of things and communication didn't happen and we dropped the ball. And, and I think it's, it's got to start with us all being on the same page of, of having that mission. Yeah. Yeah. I agree completely. And, and, you know, Spodak, we do this once a year where we have an all day team meeting. And then we also have, you know, quarterly meetings where the entire team is involved. It's just not an all day. It's like a half day or a couple of hours where we kind of like reflect back on like how we're doing it. It's similar to like any error view, you know, like how are we doing in, in regards to our goals? What's going right? What's going wrong? What maybe needs to be adjusted um, now that we're along the way, you know, now that things are developing. And that's when we kind of adjust our vision and our mission statement. And we do it as a team. We, we reflect every single year on our core values and our mission and our vision, where we want to go in the next three to five years kind of thing. And we end up, you know, shifting our sales a little bit, adjusting our sales a little bit. And it's it's healthy and normal and natural, but it, it really does empower the team. It's one of the things that I think is most empowering when you include the team and give everyone a voice in shaping what the culture is, because then there's a level of responsibility to fulfill what they brought to the table, you know, that otherwise it's like, oh, well, that wasn't my idea. I didn't agree to that, you know? Um, So I think it's good to empower people. And, you know, Erica, who's our COO at Spodak is great at um, helping people to quote unquote trip over the truth. So she, you know, she's really great at leading conversations about um, like asking quality questions so that people actually trip over the answer and solve their own problem, because that's really empowering too. And that's a great part of um, like an enabling, empowering, um, uh, really strong culture, you know, that, that is the foundation on which our goals are built. Again, I can't say that enough, you know, so if, if we don't have all this stuff down before we start strategizing and goals, right, we're going to find that it's much harder to reach because we've got all this underlying drama and contention and, and patients are going to sense that too. You know, like you, you mentioned patients do interact with everyone from their first phone call. That's, that's, you know, incredibly, if that person doesn't understand the culture and the values and doesn't have high morale, like that's it, people can sense that over the phone. They can sense if people are are you know communicating with them honestly and how the team is going to be and all that stuff. It's a first impression. And then physically arriving in the building, yes, like the the first impressions person, you know, checking them in and insurance verification and all the communication that goes into that. If we don't have like all this behind the scenes um, uh, morale stuff and culture stuff figured out and communication stuff figured out for ourselves, that's going to come across to the patients as like, they can, they can feel the lack of unity. They can feel a lack of, um, continuity of care, you know, and that's definitely not what we want. Right. So I want to talk about what, what are some common things because I've seen, um, just in my brief time, you know, I've been practicing for almost nine years, um, and at, at Spodak and other practices that I, that I was at before I was at Spodak, I've seen a lot of common things that are just like repeating. It's like history repeats itself. And it's just like, oh, dang, it was just the same thing in a different way, you know, but, but I've seen some specific things really diminish morale and, and things that really keep team culture from thriving and really keep, um, 
keep organizations stuck, I think. So I want to, I want to tap on those a little bit before we talk about what boosts morale and what will, what will help us get us out of the tangled mess, you know? Um, and then Shariza, I, I want your, you know, obviously opinion on this too, but one of, one of the main things that I've seen, um, is that whenever people in leadership over promise and under deliver, that is a big burn to people. So it's worse than not promising in the first place. You know, when you don't promise something in the first place, no one else has an expectation, you know, but when you promise something, if, if you say, Hey, um, Julie, I will check in with you. I will send you an email on that. I'll follow up with you next week on by Friday. It, you know, even if something is, as you know, seemingly mundane as that, like if, if I then don't follow through with that, I over promise and under delivered and Julie trust me a little less now, you know, I just, I just kind of harmed our relationship. And if I'm in leadership, that's like how Julie's going to perceive. It's just like when a patient walks in, they go to our bathroom and it's messy. Everything else might be perfect, tip top shape, you know, everything's sterilized. It's clean. It's whatever. But their impression is that we are disorganized and this place is dirty. That's Julie's impression of our organization. Like, oh, wow, this person in leadership, like they just promised me something. They gave me their word. They didn't follow through. So, so yes, Julie's making a generalization. It's never smart for Julie or anyone to do that. Right. But we, as humans kind of do that. We draw conclusions in the absence of complete information, right? So we fill in the blanks. So Julie's going to be like, wow, that's, that's harmful. Um, another example of that is like when uh, team members are promised something, like if they're, they're promised a, a bonus or um, uh, cash, something or other, or whatever for reaching, for reaching goals, for, you know, attaining something that seems like, oh my God. And then, and then there's no follow through on that, like, or, or it's not the promise that was given to them at the beginning when we set the goal as a team, you know, the follow through when it's not there can be more damaging than just not doing those things in the first place. Right. Well, I think you said, you said earlier, and and I think you, you like hit the nail on the head with the word trust. Mm -hmm. We lose trust. And that's a big part of team is having that trust, knowing they've got, knowing that we each have each other's backs, knowing that we can trust our leadership, knowing that we can trust someone else to stand in the gap if, if you know, we, we can't make it. So that's really, really big. So yes, you've got to be from a, from a leadership standpoint, any, anyone in leadership has got to come across as trustworthy and, and do what they say they're going to do. Right. Absolutely true. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's one thing that majorly diminishes morale and, um, uh, like counter wise, like the, the opposite of that is like one thing that really develops team culture is history, having a history together. So meaning like, okay, now, you know, I just think back on Spodak, uh, I've been there for, uh, ooh, almost seven years now. Um, but when I, you know, was first there, I was pretty new there. Uh, we had a goal to achieve so many, you know, Invisalign cases in a year, like achieve a certain Invisalign, you know, a status or something. Um, and we achieved it as a team and we, you know, killed the goal. We crushed it. And then we went to the, O, oh, which is like a really nice, uh, hotel experience. It's like a spa experience, um, in, you know, South Florida. It's, it's beautiful. It's on the beach. It's gorgeous. We had a great time, but that history. So, so there was a promise of something. If there was, if this, then that, right. and then there was follow through. And now I have a memory. I have a memory of that follow through and we have history together. So the people who had that experience with me, we now have a deeper bond because we all overcame something. We overcame a challenge. And now we've got that experience, experiential memory together, you know, and that, that is something that really, really strengthens culture. It's, it's the history together and like time and experiences together really build on that. Correct. I agree entirely. Yeah. Um, another thing that diminishes morale is, and I've seen this happen, you know, if I'm not, if my hygienist or a hygiene assistant or someone brings something to my attention and then I don't acknowledge and follow through with some sort of solution or make sure that they have solved the problem that can really diminish morale too. So it's, it's not addressing concerns as they're brought to the attention of leadership, sweeping problems under the rug, minimizing problems instead of acknowledging and working toward a solution. So they're just, a lot of this just has to do with follow through, right? It's like, okay, like I can be a really good listener and say, Hey, thanks so much, Julie, for, for bringing that to my attention. I really appreciate that. And Julie might appreciate that I listen initially, but then if there's no follow through, it's like, well, why, why, why am I going to do that in the future? I've just taught Julie, like, it's not, again, it's kind of like the, you know, when doctors don't verify our findings or tell us our, our assessment is, is worth it or whatever. We learn like, okay, we're not going to do that anymore. Nothing came of it. And unfortunately what, what that equals is it breeds contempt and resentment and bitterness 
And because we've got all these issues that, you know, someone came and said, Hey, I need your help solving this particular problem. Would you be my mediator? Would you help me strategize to come up with a solution? So it's not just about talking the problem, problem, problem. We're talking problem. Let's come to a solution together. Let's, uh, let's team it out. Let's work it out kind of thing, work out the details. And the results, unfortunately, you know, that, that resentment of that unresolved problem and that, that break, that breach in trust, you know, between a leadership person and a person who came to me with trust, you know, taking a risk and being vulnerable and saying, Hey, I see an issue. This is what I propose as a solution. Like, can you help me with this? And then me dropping the ball. Um, the result is that passive aggression and that harms everyone, you know, and, and people do this, I think when they feel helpless, you know, they, they just, they feel that boiling resentment under the surface because they, you know, voice something, it was swept under the rug. It wasn't acknowledged or it wasn't, uh, uh, dealt with adequately. And then it, it just harms the whole team and harms relationships. Yeah. And I think a lot of times if somebody comes to you with something that um, feels uncomfortable or feels hard or feels like failure, that's where I'm really going with this is a lot of times if we feel like there's a failure, depending on our mindset, that might be uncomfortable and then we don't want to deal with it. So we just view it as, oh, we're not doing that well. And I don't really want to face that and think about that. I don't really know how to deal with that. Whereas instead, and you said this earlier and we do this as well, like we as a team will say like, hey, what worked really well yesterday? What didn't work yesterday? Mm -hmm. there, there is a whole lot of psychology behind really kind of looking at your failures because that's where the growth comes from. Yeah. So if you're scared to address those things because they look like failures, um, that's probably some digging you need to do as to the why behind that, because really the failures are where we're growing. Failure means that we're trying. We tried something new or different, or we, we need a new way that works better. Um, but failures are those things that a lot of times we get scared of. So we don't really pursue them, but that's really, really the opportunity for us to break through and become a better team and become a better practice. But I think that's, that's a lot of the reasons why people kind of shy away is like, you know, if somebody's coming and saying, Hey, this isn't working for me, or this is hard, or I don't know how to deal with this, then we can be uncomfortable and not know how to solve it. And so we just kind of avoid it and that never makes it better. So I think being open to viewing failure as opportunity is huge. Yeah. And I think that goes back to like, you know, psychology as it always yeah. does psychology and communication where, um, you know, it's not, if we can separate our value and our worth from our performance, because it, it's true that like, you know, I make mistakes. I make, I make tons of mistakes and I've made tons of mistakes before overcoming and doing some of the best things and really getting to the solution or getting to the outcome that I wanted. Like so many, usually I think if I look back on my life and maybe you can say the same, there's probably a lot more mistakes and failures and stumbled over all kinds of BS before I arrived at the solution that I wanted or the outcome that I, like, you know, it's just a part of the journey. And the, the more we can separate our worth and, uh, you know, who we are as a person and like, am I valuable based on my performance? Like separate the performance from your worth basically is right. the point, you know? Correct. Correct. Yeah. And I think yes. a good way to do that is like reflecting. And a lot of us have, you know, unresolved issues. We could talk for days on unresolved issues from childhood. We won't do that. Um, but, you know, we just have unresolved things that we're not questioning, you know, like, why do I feel this way when someone uh, offers constructive criticism. Why do I, why am I'm personally attacking myself? You know, what's my, what's my, um, inner monologue like when someone comes to me with, uh, criticism or a problem or a challenge, usually it's not about me. You know, even if, even if my action led to an undesirable outcome, that doesn't reflect me as a human, you know, it doesn't mean I'm less valuable or less lovable. The person doesn't like me and, and it may in some instances, but like, who cares? Let's get to a solution. Let's work through it and move forward. You know? Um, what everyone wants in that situation is a better outcome. You know, right. I don't think anyone, most people don't just come with a problem because they want to make you like, it's not usually about blame. Sometimes it is. And that's that person has to take responsibility for that. But I don't think it's usually about blame. I think it's like, we all want the solution. So what's the solution? Let's try together and, and put our egos aside and put like our, our worth aside because we're, we're all humans who are worthy of love and respect and you know, whatever. Um, and if we can just accept that and treat each other as that and have that sort of inner monologue with ourselves all the time, then it's going to be easier to hear these things and create better morale. Right. Well, and I think so, so much of morale comes through our, our perceptions, right? And if we can realign those, and I think that's what having those kind of um, 
you know, meetings and, and kind of reevaluations can do for us. Because I know for me, there's times where my day is, is slammed and I'm nonstop and I can't even see outside of my own operatory. Um, and you kind of forget that every other person in the office is juggling just as many balls as you are. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes, and I'm probably not the only one that feels this way, but sometimes I'll be in the middle of a hectic, crazy day. And I find myself like having a really bad reaction to another team member who dropped one of their balls, which is absolutely ridiculous because that happens for me personally all the time. Right. Um, and I think it's, it's kind of re grounding yourself with your perspective of, Hey, you know, my front desk, like my business team, my appointment coordinator answers the phone all day. She has people walking in the door. She has cases to check in. She has appointments to confirm. She has appointments to schedule. She has, I mean, receipts to check. Like there's so many things that she has to do. Yeah. And then I switch over and look at the assistants and all the tasks they have to do. I mean, there's, everybody has got so much going on. And, you know, we've all heard the, the uh, quote of there is no I in team. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's where a lot of discord comes from is when we start just seeing it through our own perspective of the me, 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 what do I need? What do, what do I not have? Like what's not happening for me is when we kind of forget that it's not just me, like it's all of us together and it's not going to work unless we're all working together. Right. And I, and I think that a, pers a common perception too is like, I just want to really look in the face the fact that I think a lot of us have this idea that success equals the absence of problems. And that's just not ever going to be true. Like if we look back in our lives, we, we will see that like, there's never been an absence of problems. There have always been, th things are constantly changing. You know, everyone's different. We all come with our own biases and our own issues. You know, we're all in this, this, uh, this, beautiful like mess of like life and relationships and learning how to be a team and learning how to be a better person and all this stuff we're all in this on this journey together but there's never going to be an absence of problems and challenges so i think if we can accept that you know having problems isn't a problem it, it is life like it's just a right. fact of life and asking you know instead of like well, I have problems. I must be failing or this must be bad. I'm not succeeding because I have problems or challenges. It's just not reality. There's never going to be an absence. And that, that goes back to just um, like beliefs and mentality. Um, and also, you know, human being, we feel the most fulfilled when we're solving problems, you know, when we're, when we're looking. That's yeah. Your, yeah. Yeah. Well, because, we, because that's what, that's all ever reaching our goals is, is solving a series of problems to get to an outcome. I was going to say, isn't it crazy? Like you think about for what we do for entertainment. Like there's people who love putting puzzles together. There's people who love playing games where you solve the mystery. You know, that I have two teenage boys. They love video games where they're like solving the game. Like, it's just crazy to me that, you know, we, we like to watch the movies or read the books of like who done it and figure it out. Yeah. Like those are things that, that can be fun and entertaining yet somehow if they happen like within work the work parameters or the business parameters, we start to be like, oh, this is uncomfortable. It's again, it's just like that head game of like, play it different in your mind then. Like, hey, this is a cool opportunity. This is something to figure out. This is something we can overcome. And like you said, that's really where the joy in life comes from. It's like, hey, I did that. That was hard and I figured it out and we did it. Yeah. Imagine, imagine if we all, if there was this switch that happened, imagine, let's imagine this. Let's just all think for a second. If we're all like, okay, we, we struggle and we hear this problem and we tend to internalize it and say, oh my gosh, I'm not good enough. What have I done wrong? There's a problem. I must be inadequate. I failed. That means I'm not a good person. Imagine if that changed to someone brings a problem to my attention and I immediately get curious. Right. Huh. I wonder why that happened. I wonder how we can prevent that from happening in the future. I wonder how we can make that better. I'm so excited to, to problem solve, right? Imagine if we approached it like a game that imagine if we gamified problem solve, because we do, we, we already do that. It's just, we don't think of that at work, you know, but, but if we could gamify it at work and say, huh, how can we get creative? Who can I collaborate? Who can I get on the team up with to solve this problem? Like it can be really interesting and life-giving, I think, you know, and, and I think it's important too to, to say, is this a quality problem or is it not? Because sometimes there's really shitty right. problems that don't deserve our attention. You know, maybe they're Let's not, not going to waste our energy on those things. Yeah. 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 Like, like for instance, I, you know, I know I gave you this example, like I had a recent aha moment in my life where I had to choose certain things that I was going to give my time to right now and, and not just on a personal level, you know, like, and, and I, I started asking my question, like myself, the question, how am I going to 
like physically survive for the next eight weeks? And I know as soon as I thought that I was like, this is not a quality question. This is not a quality problem. Like this is a very, if I'm asking myself, how am I going to get adequate sleep? How am I going to eat? How am I going to do that? Like th- something has to change. That is a red flag. So sometimes the the questions that we're asking and the problems that we're having can, can cue us off to like, all right, does something need to change here? Like, is this a really quality problem? That's, that's not a quality problem. You know, a quality problem is like, how am I going to be my most actualized self today? Like, what can I do to develop that? Or like, how, how did I, how did I not do that yesterday? What could I do today to potentially be more myself? You know, like that's a, that's a quality question, a quality problem, you know? So I think it's important that we're examining that too. We don't want to spend too many, too much time on problems that aren't, high quality shouldn't be being asked. Maybe we need to make a a pivot, you know, of some sort, if we find those questions being asked a lot. Yeah. Um, so what, so let's, let's go to what we're all here for, which is the solution. Um, what boosts morale and why does it matter? So why does, why does morale matter? So we said that morale was the confidence, enthusiasm, and discipline of a person or group at a particular time. So to me, that just sounds like unity. You know, we're, we're on the same page. We're all sharing in that confidence and enthusiasm and that discipline. We, we all have agreed upon what that looks like for us. And we're all in the process of, of achieving that, you know, so why, what boosts morale and why does it matter? Uh, like, like we mentioned, you know, we're not robots. We, we have all these different parts. It's just part of being human. We have the social part, the mental, the physical, spiritual relation, all this stuff, uh, you know, the basic needs stuff, you know, we're all humans, but we need to, to not subscribe to like, oh, we're at work now. We're going to switch off the humanity. Like, no, we're, we're people. We still need to remember that we relate to each other. We have common issues and, you know, we're all in, in the, in the grind and the struggle together and we help each other overcome our challenges every day. Um, so, the, the connection that we form with each other appropriately and with boundaries as humans matters in a work setting, in, in, a, in a work setting. So um, boosting morale, uh, one of the things that does that is something that we touched on earlier is letting others engage and flex their leadership. So what Erica does, you know, to get other people curious is just asking them questions. Like someone says, uh, you know, the, um, the Cavatron's not working and, and she's, she's, instead of just saying, Hey, I'm, I'm going to play mom right now. And I'm going to go fix the Cavatron, ask a series of questions. Like, did you try this? Did you try that? Did you do that? Did you, well, what's the next step? What do you think should happen now? You know? And it's not about, of course, some things are urgent and they should be like, yes, we've got to deal with this right now. You know, we, we shouldn't table the Cavatron issue. Like this is an urgent situation kind of thing. We need to get this working again, but also whenever there is room and time for it, when it's appropriate, we can have the person solve their own problem. And in the future, they're unable to solve their own problem. And they get in this habit of thinking independently, thinking like a business owner, you're, you're training them at that point to think like a business owner, take ownership over this problem. And you're, you're training them to trust themselves. Like, Hey, you had a problem. You brought it to my attention. Look, you just solved your own problem. You're a badass. You know, like that's, they're flexing their own leadership. They can help others solve that same problem. And even though the Cavatron one is a very simplified problem, I understand. Um, but, but still that's, you're allowing and enabling others to flex their own leadership and they become more empowered to keep doing that. You know, it's the same thing that we talked about initially in our, our first podcast about Dr. Craig. He took a big risk saying, and he still does on new doctors and other hygienists and admin team. And, you know, whenever he's like, Hey, here's a, you know, I, I see that you're interested in this. Hey, why don't you take this? Why don't you take ownership of that? And this is, you know, the agreed upon outcome. Our, our team wants to all strive to reach this outcome. So why don't you come up with a system to reach that outcome? And then that person does that and follows through and reaches that outcome. And then they're like, so like a different person, you know, they, they're, they, their morale and their feeling of like contribution to the community, to our, to our team community. Yeah, they feel valuable. They, they yeah, they feel valuable. Yeah. Um, and I think I, I agree with everything that you're saying. I think there's, um, just so much empowerment when we can kind of solve our own problems. And so I know at ADS, we, we have a thing where if you're going to bring a problem, you got to also bring a solution with it because that already has you thinking towards, you're not just coming in complaining about something and be like, Hey, this thing doesn't work, or this isn't working for me. And, you know, kind of whining about it. You're actually, you've already been proactive and said, Hey, this thing isn't working, but I think this, this might be a better solution. Mm -hmm. And that already has you put you in the position of 
being open-minded and, and being solution oriented. So I think that's a great idea if you, if you don't have that implemented in your practice. Yep. Every single review. What are some of the challenges that you're having? How do you think you can overcome them? Steps to steps to overcoming the challenge, you know, and even if their idea doesn't end up being the one that solves it, they're still involved in the process and the outcome. You know, I'm still involved in the process and the outcome. So that's important. Um, and another, you know, big thing, you know, um, contrasting with people in leadership over-promising and under-delivering, something that boosts morale is under-promising and over-delivering or delivering uh, a high level of care to each other uh, unexpectedly even, you know, that's, that's just like it is, you know, like almost synergistically, I don't know how else to put it, damaging to overpromise and underdeliver. It's like synergistically empowering to underpromise and overdeliver. So if you, you know, surprise your team with a bonus, like, I don't, I don't feel like that's the best strategy because then no one knows what they're shooting for, but sometimes like, oh my God, that's, that's so amazing. Or to at least follow through on what has been promised. You know, it's, it's always better to not promise if there's a chance you won't deliver, you know? So, so if you're not sure, I would say, say nothing. That's, that's less damaging in, in the big picture than over promising and under delivering and then not, not following through with your words. So don't say you're going to send the email. If you don't put it in your calendar afterwards to send that email, or you're not, you're not intending to do that right away, because even that small thing can leave a lot to be desired in a, in a relationship with a leadership team member, especially, you know? I think there's got to be truth and consistency in what you're doing. So how weird does it sound to say, hey, we as a practice, we take really great care of our patients. We go above and beyond and take really great care of our patients. But then if we turn around and we're not taking really good care of our team and each other, that's not truth between there. There's that truth is not meeting up between those two entities mm -hmm. and, it, and it's not going to, to be successful. You know, the patients are going to feel that, you know, the tension, the, the team feels the tension and doesn't feel appreciated and they're not giving the patients the care they need. I think it's, it's one big cycle. And it, and you know, if that's, if that's your mission and that's your goal is to provide your patients with the most excellent care, then you've got to be doing that as a team to one another as well. Yeah. There's, there's a lack of consistency and integrity there. Right. You know, because it, we're, we're saying like, oh, humans are worthy of this, but we're not going to treat each other that way. Like that just, there's, there's, there's not truth. Clearly like that would mean that we don't truly feel that way completely about patients. We don't truly feel that way completely about ourselves, or it would be across the board. Right. Yeah, totally. Um, so, so, you know, remembering that Others need to flex their leadership muscles and trip over their own truth and solve their own problems. It's a big morale booster. And then um, the, um, what were we just saying? I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. I blame it on Dayquil. Uh, so I, I have one to add while you're kind of looking at your notes. Okay. I, think, I think a great morale booster is um, celebrating our mm -hmm. wins together. Um, you know, we talk about kind of figuring out learning from our failures and that's huge, but I think there's a lot of value in celebrating our wins together and cheering each other on and being aware of what's happening around the practice. That's good. And, and that we can all rally behind. I mean, again, if we're going to liken this to a, you know, a sports, you know, an athletic team, they celebrate their wins. You know, they learn from their losses. They go back and practice harder and make sure they understand it and are doing it the right way. And then they celebrate their wins. And I think that's really, really important for morale. You don't want to just skip over that. If you have some big wins, you don't want to just be like, oh yeah, we did that. That was good. And then go on. Like, people worked hard for that and people yeah. invested themselves and, and maybe worked overtime for that or, you know, whatever it is. And it's really, really important that we acknowledge each other for that. Um, we have acknowledgements in our morning meetings, like, Hey, who, you know, who did something great yesterday? Or we have, um, we have a team culture where we actually give each other, we call them um, ADS bucks. We can, we give $50 a month when we hit a certain goal um, to, you have to give it to another team member for going above and beyond. And it's a, you know, Thing that you know we say out loud hey I want to acknowledge you because you did this this and this and yep. it's just it's empowering and it's and you feel appreciated and everybody you know we're all very well aware of how it feels when people are saying bad things behind our back versus saying great things as a team in front of our faces and right. that, again that's when we're talking about morale that's that's where it's at and and I think the celebrating goes hand in hand with holding accountable even though it doesn't initially maybe sound that way um, because celebrating means that, you know, someone set a goal and they reached it and you measured and followed back up with that, you know, so that could sometimes look like 
not necessarily celebrating, but saying, Hey, I noticed like you set this goal and you know, you asked me to keep you accountable and you're not quite hitting the mark. How can I help you? How can I support you to meet this goal? So coming alongside people and, and becoming their accountability, that way you can celebrate with them because you know what their goals are. You're invested in them reaching their goals and reaching their full potential. So you can celebrate with them. You can resolve issues and, and kind of sift through problems and, and think critically with them. You can sit down and have just like these transparent, authentic conversations. Um, but back to what you said about transparency too, is I think that there just needs to be this transparency that trickles down from any leadership in an organization. Like there just needs to be uh, honesty about things that are, you know, and, and I don't think that everything has to be shared with every team member. There are appropriate things and appropriate settings, time, place, all that stuff. But I think just in the big picture, team members, you know, should be involved and know what's going on within the organization. Are we doing well? Are we not? Uh, what, what needs to happen? Like, what do you as an organization, as a leader have fears right now? What are you afraid of? How are you resolving those fears? Like all of that stuff, I think just needs to be shared, you know? And I don't think um, when things are being shared, like I know we talked about before in regards to coming to a solution or conclusion that everyone has to be involved all the time with like, oh, here, here are the 10 options, you know, right. help us pick the 10 options. You want to narrow it down maybe, and then share the, the options and enable the team to be a part of the solution and whatever. Um, but I think there, there does need to be constant communication, constant transparency, constant follow up, you know, and follow through and asking people like, Hey, how, what do you think about this? How's it going? You know, just, just check-ins with leadership is just really helpful too, because people just know that you care, you right. know, cause we do. And I think that especially in bigger organizations, like yours or mine, where yours is multi-location and mine's just giant and we've got 40 people and it's multi-specialty and everyone's there in their own little zone, you know, every single day. Like if we don't make an intentional effort to follow up and connect with people and follow through, then it, there's going to be a, a gap there. There's going to be a problem, you know? So I think that transparency and, and just authenticity and constant communication is, is really important for morale. People, people just need to know that you're there, that you care, that you trust, that we all realize we're all human, humans having a human experience. So another way, um, a specific way that we uh, at Spodak, and I think that at ADS, you guys do this too, we have team socials and we kind of have allocated a budget now to team socials. So we have um, whole office socials, which are periodic. I think they're quarterly, bi biannually, I'm not sure, because I know that now the trickle down from the hygiene department has been that all the other departments have started doing their own socials too. And I think that it, I can see the shift in unity and willingness for people to help each other at work after these team socials. And I know that, you know, Dr. Bolden mentioned that this is kind of like a, a hands-off topic. Like people don't really want to breach the, the having fun outside of work um, aspect anymore. I know there are a lot of um, a lot of PC issues that can take place and no one wants the liability sort of thing. And, and like, I get that. Um, and I, uh, from an ownership perspective, I'm sure that there are pros and cons and risks and benefits and everyone's got to weigh what those are for themselves. Um, but team socials for us have been one easy and super cost-effective way to improve morale um, for our hygiene team. And some of those have looked like, and the, by the way, cost-effective, these, these are like hundreds of dollars, not like thousands or mil, you know, it's not anything crazy. You don't go to like a hotel for a weekend. I'm talking, we went deep sea fishing as a hygiene team one time. And that was like 400 bucks, you know, like for a whole day of deep sea fishing, we had a great time. We caught like no fish, but we all, you know, drank and talked and remembered that we were people and, and got some sun, you know, it was, it was great. We've been bowling. We've done happy hour. We've done all kinds of stuff, you know? Um, and I think going back to culture, if our culture is pretty solid, I don't think that and you're hiring the right people with the right ethics and integrity and attitudes and stuff. I don't think you're going to have a huge drama problem, even at these like social separate events, you know, because if all that groundwork is already laid, I don't see why everyone would develop into this completely different person outside of work, you know, right. if they're the right person in work. So, so we haven't had, I mean, we've had virtually no challenges, knock on wood with our having team socials. It's only helped our department and made us more cohesive and stronger and love each other and, and be willing to have, quote unquote, sweaty back conversations with each other. And we love each other enough to face things together, you know? Well, and I mean, I, I can speak for my own day. Like there's days. So in my location, we have two of us hygienists and there's days that we literally say hi to each other in the morning and then goodbye at the afternoon because our day ran so busy that we don't have time to really connect. 
So yeah, I think getting outside of the office and relaxing and playing and being silly and getting to like really know each other. Yeah. You know, when we really know and understand each other, we're, we are more willing to, to help and support and, you know, befriend each other. And, you know, we don't have to be best friends in the practice. Like we know that, um, but just having a relationship and being supportive and, and having that unity. And I, yeah, that's absolutely having fun together is awesome. Yeah. And you know, like you, you just mentioned, you just mentioned that there are like, okay, you know, there are personality differences. Like there, everyone doesn't like, we're not everyone's favorite person. Everyone's not our favorite person. It doesn't have to be like your best friends. Like just go remember that you're all humans, you know, like just, just go have, uh, so do something fun together. You know, it makes a big difference. Um, and I just wanted to touch on something uh, we stumbled across on simplicable.com. Um, it's about team culture. And it, you know, it said, and this really resonated with me, some of these things that they listed. Um, team culture are the collective behaviors of a team that emerge over time as a result of shared experiences and leadership. And then it gave uh, some common elements of team culture. So, so some of the elements were norms or standards of behavior. So that's like having agreements or standard operating procedures, things that, you know, regulate and give expectations, um, humor, inside jokes, criticism. And on the site, it actually said, you know, saving face uh, behavior. So I understand that that means, you know, protecting the reputation of the organization and having that family protect this house mentality. But for me, it's kind of like more important to save your ass, not your face. And what I mean by that is um, instead of just saving face, save the actual organization, like do what's, what's hard and what's best, even if it's just, even if it boils down to doing more work than just saving face and saving reputation, you know, and I think that true stakeholders and people who want to be there will, will take the time and energy to do that. Um, the next thing was habits, routines, and practices that we have established and have in place traditions like celebrating birthdays and anniversaries, something that we do. Every single time we, we have birthday cakes for birthdays, we have cards, we all sign the cards and that's a lot of cards, people 40, there's 40 of us. Okay. That's a lot of cards floating around. I have carpal tunnel, not from hygiene, but from signing birthday cards. Okay. Um, and anniversaries, you know, meaning I've been there, you know, six, seven years, whatever we celebrate, someone gets a new pin. They're acknowledged in huddle by Dr. Craig, who's our leader. Um, and it's just awesome. It's a tradition that we have that makes us feel special Our holiday party. That's tradition. I know you guys have got some of these things in place too. Do you guys do the birthdays and all that stuff for, yes. yeah, yeah. 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 It's a huge morale builder. Um, and then the one that I mentioned before history, developing history together, shared experiences of overcoming and reflecting on our practice history. So some of it's just really cool to look back, you know, Spodek's been there since 1976 and Dr. Craig is a third generation dentist and it was originally developed in New York and then came to South Florida. And just, just knowing some of that history is really cool, but then creating your own history through those shared experiences and overcoming obstacles together. It's like, you can look back on your own history in the organization and, and it just brings attachment and it brings that like wow this is my house you know this is my place we have um i know we are very very blessed at ads because we have our own videographer mm -hmm. um Bo, and he is amazing at putting together um these patient testimonial videos and he'll kind of follow the patient through their process and it's so amazing to go back and watch these videos and see you know the that patient, because of the care that we as a practice gave them, were able to get their life back and smile again and feel confident again. And, and you know, they, they had smiled for years, never showing their teeth, and now their face just lights up. And there's just something that's like so heartwarming about that. And again, it takes you back to your purpose of like, this is why we're here. And it's just that visual reminder. Mm -hmm. um, and even if it was not at a location that I work at, it's still like just that, oh my gosh, this is what we as a team, we as a family are, are working towards and, and doing together. Yeah. And it's just, yeah, it's exactly what you're saying. It's like that history and that it, it's awesome. Well, I think of you guys too. And I just saw, you know, on, on your Instagram, how you did the toys for tots thing during the holidays where you guys all go shopping together and you pick out toys and you, you give it to, you know, kids who, who are maybe not otherwise receiving gifts for the holidays. And that's just really special, you know, like you guys can always look back at that. And again, Bo did a great job with videography on that music and all that stuff, but you guys can always look back and think back on how you did that as a team, you know, yeah, it's a really cool thing. Um, another thing is language, developing language unique to the team. So it's funny because I think of like, this seems like such a silly thing. I swear it's the silly things that really connect people though. Like we do, we call exams POEs and COEs, periodic oral eval and comprehensive oral evals. 
Um, and Dr. Paisner and I, Dr. Paisner really appreciates my ability to combine words in stupid ways just to make them funner to say. And, and this isn't really an instance of that, but he, he's, he's kind of quirky and funny and I feel like I'm quirky and funny. So we, we have our own like shared language. Like we call them pose and co's the pose I need a po please and it's such a stupid little silly thing but like there's so many things like that that it's just like it, it makes you laugh and it's kind of like silly and funny and you have this like secret language between each other so I totally get that part of it too because we've, we've got it with like so many people at work um expectations so having clear expectations for resilience and overcoming together having a, a certainty that that's going to happen and that's an expectation having an ethical climate knowing what quote unquote right and wrong is, you know, having similar values and integrity, um, change, the ability to embrace innovation and technology, having camaraderie, which is a sense of belonging and social fulfillment. So that goes back to those, those uh, team socials, I think, uh, tone, creative and collaborative environment, as opposed to like a political or a PC or stern kind of rigid environment. Uh, and then loyalty, faithfulness to the team, commitments and obligations are fulfilled. So, this, so the morale and, and the um, community feel and team culture are all just pivotal. And I can't say this enough. Like I, I Teresa, you're is right. Like we were talking about how foundational it is before we start building anything else. We know that, you know, we can't do a full mouth restoration with active perio disease because we don't build houses on quicksand. Like we can't build our organization on a, on a crappy foundation. We have to have the culture and the uh, agreements and the morale figured out before we can start building on our goals and what we want to achieve together. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, and don't we all want that? Don't we all want to work at a place that feels amazing and knows, know that we are supported um, know what our mission is and do whatever it takes to work together to get there. I think, yeah. So I feel like if you're listening to this and, and maybe, um, maybe some of your takeaways are, you know, Hey, let's, let's talk a little bit more about our failures and, and learn from those. Or maybe we do need to take, take on this, you know, Hey, if I'm going to bring a problem and also bring a solution, you know, there's some, some good takeaways from this, but if you're, you're listening and you're like, gosh, I don't even know that we have a foundation to really start on yet. I think it's, sitting down together and saying, hey, what's our, what's our collaborative mission and our goal here? What is it that we're really, what's the story we want to tell? What is the story of our practice? And what do we want people to say about us? And what do we want patients to know about us? And start there and kind of put your story together and then just build together as a team to, to hit your goals and, and reach, your, reach your goals. Yeah, I love that you called it a story. I think that that's so cool. It's just this developing thing. You know, it's just, it's developing and evolving. Yeah. So if that is all that you have on that, that is all I think that we could wrap up at this point. Um, do you feel good about that, Teresa? Yeah, I'm go team. Go team. All right. Well, thank you guys so, so much for joining us for another episode. We hope that this uh, episode on morale and team culture has been enlightening. We know that we have been enlightened uh, just as we've developed our own team culture and morale and struggled and come to the conclusions that we have on our own teams. We would love to hear what you think. Um, if you could just connect with us on our Mighty Network, you can download the app if you want and search Bulletproof Hygiene and kind of please let us know how you have developed your team culture, how you would like to develop it any challenges that you're having, we'd love to troubleshoot with you. So please connect with us there. And don't forget to go to um, bulletproofsummit.com if you're interested in meeting us in person. Of course, we would love to see your face, shake your hand, and hopefully by then give you a big old hug um, in person. That's the ultimate team outing, by the way. The ultimate team outing. And by the way, yeah, so there's going to be dentists, um, hygienists, and team. So that can be admin team, first impressions, anyone else. Who wants to come? There's going to be all kinds of segments and breakouts this year. If you're curious about it or want more information, go to bulletproofsummit.com and we hope to see you there. Bye-bye, everybody. 